and welcome to the Motivity State podcast, the space where we dive into mobility, movement, biomechanics, neurology, and much, much more. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Motivity State podcast. My name is Rado, and I'll be the host for this and next uh, episodes. My guest um, today in this first episode is the one and only Gary Ward. He's one of my mentors. Uh, Gary, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's always a delight to be on the first. Yeah, yeah. As I said, you probably have more than, than I have. So, I mean, the person with more experience is being interviewed. Cool. Uh, I want to first um, share my personal story of how I found you. Um, and then we're going to continue on with a few questions and you're going to share some knowledge, hopefully. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, a um, couple years ago, I was looking for answers for fixing myself uh, or how people call it. And then uh, because I was on the way, but like I was getting the big things uh, done and fixed, but then those small things uh, I was missing. And then one time I was talking to a friend of mine, her name is Galina Denzel, and she's a friend of mine. And uh, she said, have you thought about um, learning from Gary? And I'm like, Gary who? She's like, Gary Ward, you should, you should check him out. And uh, I went to your website, off, uh, ordered your book, What the Foot, started reading through it. And then my brain went like, boom. I mean, what the hell? I mean, this is totally different to me. Like the principles in the book that you talk about yeah. uh, were totally new to me. Although I've been like playing sports and like being active all my life and still uh, I was coaching people, but I, and I mean, again, that was totally something new. So after reading the book, I checked when was the first available that I can go to a course of, I mean, uh, in person, because back then, back to the old normal, uh, yeah. people were able to travel and uh, learn in person. And um, I went to your Lisbon retreat in 2018, I 18. think it was, 18, yeah, yeah for, and uh, learned from you for six straight days. And then everything else is history. Although for the first year or so, I was like, just because it's something new and you know, when you're resisting, uh, when it's something new, you resist the change at first. Yeah. So uh, I didn't, I didn't dive into for the first year. I was just like dabbling and like playing around just, I mean, being hesitant. And then 2019, at the end of it, I started like applying in uh, principles on, on myself and then with clients. And then this totally changed my game forever. And I mean, it's been getting results for clients. So I'm really thankful Amazing. for for what you have shared and continue sharing. So if you are uh, to introduce yourself, I mean, you, you probably repeated this a thousand times, but for oh, yeah. the people who don't know, who don't know you and, or never heard of you, can you do a brief uh, introduction of and, and share your bio of who Gary Ward is? Sure. Um, Gary Ward is, as he was to you back when Galena mentored him, is still probably uh, quite new to many people. So, um, uh, but also have a very nice, nice following uh, currently. But um, my story is um, I'm an untrained anatomist, so I don't have any formal qualifications. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. But I, I originally began a life um, working as a ski boot fitter, uh, fitting orthotics for ski boots and helping people to be comfortable in their ski boots with the goal of um, um, one, one, being comfortable and two, um, performing better. So transmitting better forces and energy onto skis to make the turns easier, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, I was prior to that, I was a, um, a trainee teacher of languages, uh, French and German speaking. And um, I decided that teaching wasn't for me, uh, which is how I ended up in the Alps because I was looking for a bit of an escape and, um, and discovered through uh, the introduction of uh, feet and the combination of teaching that that would probably be how I spend the rest of my life. So um, that's what I do now is, is uh, we, uh, we see ourselves as educators. Um, and it was, a, it was a slow process. So 
one I was taught in three days about the human foot, which uh, some people kind of can't um, believe, but uh, you know, 26 bones, 33 joints, what pronation is, what supination is, how to build an orthotic, how to the impact of a ski boot, the different ski boot shapes, if you pronate the foot where the uh, the bones will move when that happens in order to put pressure on the boot. So you have you get pressure on the navicular, you get your big toe pushing into the end, the lateral fifth metatarsal pushing into the side of the boot. If it's the wrong size, how the where the foot will sit in the boot. And and I just became really obsessed really quickly. Um, I'd already been at that point um, working out training uh, for a good six, seven or eight years um, and was heavily into um, exercise and sport and, and everything. So things started kind of dropping, but nobody had ever told me about the foot and, and, and really anatomy was a brand new thing as well. So um, having, um, well, really quickly, I remember within the first week of being let loose on patients and not patients, clients, shop clients selling <laughs> the ski boots um, and people would just come in the shop and they had problems with their feet in their boots and we would look at the foot um, and I think what had been planted in me, um, Rado, was this idea of what a neutral foot should look like. And I was looking at people's feet going, that is not a neutral foot. So what can I do to help it be neutral? And the response to them having a better positioned foot in their ski boot was always one of two things. One was they felt that they performed better on, the, on their skis that day. And they would come back and say things like, I've never skied as well in my life. What did you do? And the other one was that their back pain uh, had gone away or their hip pain wasn't present today. Again, what did you do? And of course, I was like, I don't know, really. <laughs> so <laughs> I probably need to find out. And, um, and it started this uh, quest. I mean, I, I fit the ski boots for six years uh, through the Alps. And then through the summers, I was training and learning as a personal trainer. So I did a three month course. Um, and then were, did personal training with lots of people, massage with lots of people, sports therapy work with lots of people, worked with injuries. Um, and eventually uh, the calling to work with the human body was bigger than the um, calling of living with the mountains as your back garden. And, mm -hmm. um, and I moved back to England and started working as a personal trainer, but also um, began the um, idea of, I, 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 had, I had new ideas because I was thinking about the foot's role in the body, which I think was relatively new at the time. Not many people were were thinking about it that way. So they would, there was lots of work around the body, not much information around the feet. Everything was isolated. Everything was muscle focused. And I was really, really curious as to how, if this foot moves in this way, what does it mean for the rest of the body? And to um, eventually start to document the input of a foot's movement on the on the leg foot, the legs movement on the pelvis the pelvis movement on the spine um, and then curiosity eventually was to fill the gaps in some of people some people's work was to find out how the human body exactly moves uh, from when the left foot is on the ground to when the left foot is back on the ground again in a single stride so during the walking cycle um, I'm pretty proud to claim <laughs> i think it's true that i'm the only person who's bothered to sit down and write down the three-dimensional journey of every single bone in the human body through every single moment of the human gait cycle uh, some people have done one leg what's happening when the body's leg, got a leg forward a leg back but the, the whole cycle is um, is what i wanted to do and um, the joy of that has, has has been incredible so it was quite an innocent thing but to recognize that the human body is basically evolving through postures as it walks um, and that those postures are often reflected in how people stand so they can access one side of their body but not the other side of the body you can see how that's reflected in their walking cycle um, and then you start to see how that points a finger at people's discomforts as well so um, quite a long journey from being introduced to a neutral foot to, to recognizing that the human body is more than a neutral uh, specimen but that it, it is something that moves through neutral. And it's really critical that we start to understand that the movement is about a full spectrum of full, um, I like the word journey, a journey from left to right, a journey from flexed to extended, a journey from anterior tilted to posterior tilted and pronated to supinated. And, and the more we can better experience that journey, the better our experience um, in our body seems to be.
Yeah, and I think uh, like uh, people don't really re uh, realize how how deep your work uh, is and how it has impacted like everyone who's learned from you. Because I know a lot of like people, med med medical professionals. Like when I was in Lisbon, uh, we had like chiropractors, we had like physios, we have like yoga instructors, like people from all fields of life. Like they 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 themselves being teachers, uh, but also like being certified medical professionals. Yeah. And and they they were never they were never taught these these connections. I mean, I, I see the same thing uh, over here in in Bulgaria, where like clients come to me and they've been to professionals before, uh, so they really say in in that in that kind of education, the formal education, they really segment the different parts of the body, and but then don't uh, come up and integrate it afterwards. And then because it's one thing to assess. Uh, on the table or the clinical table, but then it's another thing when the body starts moving. And I keep trying to say this and, and educate people about this, that there are differences. And, and to me, the biggest impact in my work has been from, from the flow motion model, model and everything that, that uh, I learned from you is the assessment part. Because when I, when I do the, the right assessment, everything else afterwards, it's easy because the exercises, exercises themselves I mean, you can you can find them everywhere, like they're online for free. But like, what yeah. makes a difference is realizing what needs to be worked, and then everything falls into place afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Paul Check was famous for saying, if, "If you're not assessing, you're guessing." Um, exactly. And the 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 more clarity you have around the depth of assessment you can do, the more you realize most people are actually guessing if they're certainly missing certain areas of the. Uh, of their understanding that they could be working on. Yeah, and and like uh, that. This brings me to the next question about uh, about like whole body movement and, and the connections between the different parts. Because uh, oftentimes and most often, I would say people will uh, will associate you with uh, being the food guy. And yeah. like when when actually um, they go deep into into your work, they'll realize that you talk about the spine, the pelvis, and everything else related. And they see when sometimes sometimes when I talk about um, uh, to my clients about how their wrist can affect their pelvis movement, and they're like, "What the hell are you talking about?" So like, uh, so uh, what is your uh, what is your um, uh, what is your approach when you start assessing people and how do you go about explaining the different connections? Because I think this is, this is vital because people like need, need more education on, on, on that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's an interesting question. So a lot of our um, approach is we, we are very much clear, have to get clear on, on a kind of baseline approach that uh, primarily I think, Somebody, I was, I've been asked to do a, a talk at a university and my original conversation is always, if I'm going to do a talk, I can't talk about anything without addressing the baselines first, because otherwise I'm not, we're not on the same page. Um, and so even to, to talk about assessment like that um, is, it feels a little bit like that because it's so, it's so advanced. And of course, um, anybody listening who is not, is not on the page will immediately dismiss the or could immediately dismiss the idea that a wrist can affect your pelvis. Um, weirdly, they're much more into the idea that a foot can affect a pelvis. So why can't a hand? Um, and, you know, I'm glad you brought that up, but just because it's, uh, it is an interesting, interesting area. And those people who have done our work and have done their assessments well, um, will bump into people who've broken fingers or damaged wrists or had sprains or broken forearms. And, um, and you often can find very quickly uh, relationships to those type of traumas in, in somebody's spine and, and pelvic movement. So um, I think it's such a huge question. Um, one of our, <laughs> um, one of our uh, we have three rules right up front, which are outlined in the book. We have five rules, but the, the first one is muscles lengthen before they contract. Number two is joints act and muscles react. Um, and you, you already said that when you read the book, you were like, okay, these, these principles are, are quite new. And that's because um, muscles lengthen before they contract is not, is not necessarily what we're thinking when, when we start to look and work with muscles. We very much talk about shortening muscles, concentric muscles, that makes them stronger, that makes them more viable. Um, and joints act muscles react is also not something that we think about because people are more on the idea of if I teach my bicep to flex, then the 
uh, to contract, then the elbow will flex. And then you've got this rule, which is me suggesting in a whole body conversation when I'm walking is that I don't actually want to be contracting muscles in order to um, move my body forward. We, we use gravity, we use the shape of the feet, we use allowance in movement. Um, and basically as my mass moves forward, the muscles will manage that, that mass. And that's a big conversation that needs to be had kind of upfront before um, really understanding what we're observing in gait. And often we've, we say on courses, and I think I've said on, on podcasts before, if you, if you want to get a sense of this, if you Google just animals like cats um, and have them sprinting like a leopard, then what, as you can see the muscle tissue, all the muscle tissue will always lengthen with a movement and contract from a lengthened state. Mm -hmm. So um, the muscle, uh, its contraction takes place when the muscle is at its most long position in movement. That's not the type of thing we're doing in a gym necessarily or in a therapeutic or rehabilitative environment. But it is the kind of thing that if you squat down and you're obviously lower into your hip flexion, that the, the glutes will extend from a, um, a, a flexed position. Uh, and so there are elements of it, but we'd like to, we want to explore that a little bit more. From the joint act side of things, it, it really is that our, our muscles have very little impact or input into the body if the joints are not able to perform their job. Um, and it doesn't actually matter how much strengthening you do around an area, or how much stimulus you put into a muscle, if the joint cannot physically complete its task of opening and closing as a joint should, um, then the muscle will have a limited amount of capacity that it can, it can um, place on that. So our focus really is the joints, the quality of movement available at the joint in three dimensions or two dimensions if it's your knee or your elbow or one dimension if it's your talocrural joint. Um, so every joint has a capacity, whether it's one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional. Um, and inside a, it, that capacity is in the three dimensions is its ability to access both ends of the spectrum inside that plane. So then we in the three dimensions, we're split into planes called sagittal, frontal and transverse. The sagittal plane we know as words like flexion and extension. And, and so the joint must be able to fulfill its flexion and extension for the muscles of flexion and extension to actually be able to complete their job. If we think about a hip, it has adduction, abduction available as well. And there are muscles that will adduct and abduct the hip. But if the adduction, abduction potential is not there, the, limb, the muscle will have limitation. And same for the transverse plane, the internal and external rotation. Um, and every joint has a surface, which is a shape, and that shape will determine the limitation and potential of movement in, in that structure. Um, and it's our job of, often as therapists to enable all of the joints to have this freedom to access all of the de degrees of freedom and movement in order to stimulate the muscles and give free life back to the person who's walking <laughs> around the planet or exercising or moving or or just wants to get out of pain um and so these joint surfaces they as i said they both limit and create the potential for movement at the structure and i often say that muscles are, are set up to both allow movement but also restrict movement and then obviously contract and cause movement in the other direction um, and so if I, if you, um, if you side bend to the left, you want the muscles on the right side of your body will allow you to side bend to the left there. What's what we call decelerating. Mm -hmm. Um, as you get to that maximum place of left lateral flexion, this muscles on the right should reach their maximum space and then create a contraction, which will stand you back up again, which is different to thinking about the left side, just contracting to pull you left. Of course, you don't need to be pulled left because once you start going left, gravity will kind of do the rest. And it's really up to the muscles of the right hand side to catch you like on a fishing rod and, and, and pull you back. Um, so it's a long way around to get back to your answer. But the joint surfaces that limit the movement and allow the movement have a knock on effect uh, in, a, in a chain. It's called the kinetic chain. So um, if you think about links in the chain as A, B, and C, then the, the correct movement at A will allow the correct movement at B and the correct movement at C, D, E, et cetera, as we, as we go on. So any limitations in A means that B is 
going to have less chance to do its job. C is going to have less chance to do its job. D has less chance to do its job. And it starts to, to, be, to get noticed until somewhere in the chain, something starts to work excessively and moving too much to make up for the lack in the rest of the chain. Um, and in that space, we're, we're now talking about the big toe, big toe and the, and the, and the forefoot, the forefoot and the rear foot, rear foot and the ankle. So if the big toe doesn't do what it needs to do, it's going to have a huge impact up not just those three ABC bones, but all the way, all the way up the chain. And so if we reverse that back to the hand, you have limitations in your wrist movement, you'll have limitations in your forearm movement, that's going to impact the elbow, limit the humerus and create changes in the shoulder. And then the shoulder, the scapula, the rib cage, that's then suddenly you're at the spine, the spine connects onto the pelvis. Now my pelvis um, is unable to achieve certain things. So believe it or not, the hand is a, um, does have the capacity to predetermine your ability to swing, swing the arm. And with the arm swing comes rotation and then counter rotation in the pelvis. So it's very quickly, if a quick explanation, <laughs> if you're looking for one, is to, is to help you understand that the hand will have a direct impact on, um, on, on the pelvis itself. And that will limit the muscles, limit the, the range of movement in the spine, et cetera. And it's those limitations that are not necessarily at the hand that will lead to mu muscle tension and joint compression relationships happening around other structures, particularly low back, hips, et cetera. And that's where a lot of this starts to fall down is the fact that my hip hurts and we treat the hip. But if the reason your hip hurts is because you struggle to uh, supinate your hand, externally rotate your hand or extend your wrist or um, then those people will be stuck with the sore back for a long time until we can actually get to the real deal which is the problem that caused it in the first place and that really back to your assessment part of the question is what we're actually looking for is to be able to observe look at the whole body look at its movement limitations cross-reference it with history um, pay attention to um, the relationships and um, and begin to unwind them. So even for even for us, I say even for us, like that was um, not how I meant it to come out. But if if I spot that a hip's not working and I focus on the hip, um, that's not necessarily going to create a benefit for anyone unless we can get down to the to, to to working with the original problem. So people with ankle sprains, wrist sprains, neck injuries, you know, anything on the extremities can can cause problems in the middle where most people have have a lot of their stuff. So the assessment is, is, is huge for everything from how they stand in their static posture, how they move the capacity to move inside that static posture. So just an upright side bend left and right an upright rotation, pelvic movements. Um, and then also to observe through the gait cycle and see, you'll see all the limitations, how they play out in a person's, in a person's movement. And of course our, our big, next step is to is to is almost to make a list of all the things they can't do see how that shows up in the model so the model will tell us that it's when their right leg is forward or it's when their heel is striking or um, when that left leg is pushing off and um and we use movement then to to give them all of that back um, and a nice check is if somebody does struggle to to move their wrist in a certain direction and they also struggle to move their pelvis in a certain direction if you give them the movement at the wrist and they're able to hold that does that give them movement back at the pelvis and that's a really cool thing and way to play around with the model so anyone who's got access to the model um, which is those people who've just been on courses that's the type of work that we encourage them to 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 get involved in so um you, anybody can do it. You should all be able to, um, what could we say, um, extend a wrist and check to see if you have more movement in your pelvis in one direction than the other. It's, it's a big one to spell out for, <laughs> for people, but um, I've done it many times. We, we remember this, uh, put extending both wrists. If you extend both wrists like this and you and you side shift your pelvis to the left and your pelvis to the right, you'll actually feel how you get more access when your pelvis is left. When your pelvis is left, you'll get more extension in your right wrist. And when your mm -hmm. pelvis is right, you'll get more extension in your left wrist. So imagine if I can't extend my wrist on the right because of a fall, then we're going to find that my pelvis naturally goes right more than it goes left. And now I've got a weight shift 
weight in my right foot, struggle to get weight in my left foot, um, probably a rotation in my spine. So it is possible to feel all of these connections in the body. Otherwise, if you couldn't, then we'd just be we'd just be making stuff up. So they're, they're genuinely real connections through the joint surfaces. That was the roundabout conversation I wanted to have. So we could come back to that idea that <laughs> there is a knock on effect from one joint to the other. And if they're not all successful, then it, it would break down somewhere. Yeah, and going back to the wrist again, like I always, uh, like not always, but whenever there is like, um, there is a hip limitation into the shift, I um, sometimes check their wrists and ask them about history and stuff. And then even if they don't have any injury or, or, or um, trauma in that area, I still check to see the differences in movement between both wrists. And then I do a quick mobilization of the, the one that's more limited. And then I call it the voodoo magic when they, they first, when I first see their faces and they uh, yeah. start shifting to the yeah, opposite. So side and they almost like, fall over. Yeah. Yeah. What, what the hell? Yeah. What so the yeah. Foot? Yeah. What the foot exactly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, definitely. And, and um, I, and going back to what you just uh, dis- uh, said about um, lecturing at the university and, and covering the basics, I teach the I teach uh, feet and lower lower body uh, workshop uh, in my studio, and uh, oftentimes I will struggle myself only to limit myself only talking about the lower body because I want to give them all the information about the connections going upward so that yeah. they actually understand and grasp the concept because otherwise it will be just a, like in in a vacuum and it, it it will just limit their perception and and they won't be able to fully comprehend why I'm asking them to do a certain thing of the yeah. foot or the hip or whatever. So uh, I always go into into details and and try to stop myself just because it's like sometimes I work with with like uh, uh, some of my clients are also colleagues of mine who are trainers and personal trainers and and some medical professionals also come to train with us. And sometimes even for them, when I start like uh, talking about the connections, but it's it's like more natural to me because I've been uh, learning and studying this for over two years now and applying it with clients. So it comes easier. I remember when I, were, uh, I was at Lisbon, you were talking about the connections and on, on like a surface, I was understanding it, but then you were asking us to write it down on the flow motion model chart. And I'm like, Hmm. I don't. I, I don't know what to write down, but but now it's now it's a, it's a lot easier because it comes with practice. So I see even with some colleagues of mine that I mean they're like whoa 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 slow it down like brain freeze right there. So yeah. if you haven't been taught this and if nobody told you before, I mean yeah, it's like too much. It's overwhelming, definitely. Yeah, I'm definitely aware of that. It's a big. It's a. It's a big. I. I mean, I still think it's simple, which is strange, and I have to convince myself that. Or remind myself that um, that uh, that it is a big a big job. I mean, I think the flow motion model on its own has 344 joint motions in it, split down into the the just the five phases. Um, and so it is it is a big job. And and something we pride ourselves on is is making that big complex structure appear simple. Uh, but then you realise there's a limit to simple and. And people will, will always struggle and make it a bit more complex anyway. Um, but uh, it, it, it is it just it's a, a description. It's like um, if you can if you can. Uh, I'm just thinking like a, a city, it's a map to get you around all the stations on the on the underground in London, for instance. Um, and so you, you need, you know, that there's a sequence, but then you know, there's a journey so I can get up to the pelvis. I can go down the other leg. I can go up the spine and down the left arm. Um, we're able to observe, um, all of the movements and in the apply then that to any sport and any practice and any training. And, uh, as I'm sure you've done many times with your, um, in your area and, um, yeah, it's a big, it's a big thing. And I must remind myself that it's uh, not as simple as I like to think. <laughs> Yeah, like actually uh, something that really won me over, like when I first came to the Lisbon workshop was like the way you you and Chris are actually teaching. Like I thought this is the first, these are the first teachers I'm learning from who are like, th- th- it, it looked like it's your calling because the way like the, I mean, there's something to, to the way you, you, you describe it, you simplify it because you, 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 you understand somebody's a good teacher if they can simplify 
the 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 big stuff. So and and, and, tr and tr translate and transfer this onto their clients uh, or or students. So that 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 was uh, like uh, really uh, great for me. And then uh, I to make it simple for myself and also for for my clients, what I do is like I hit every single part of the body um, as, uh, separately. And then after I give it a little bit of move or we facilitate a little bit of movement here and there mobilize or move this specific area through uh, different strategies, then I start integrating it in, into the big movement for, because for most people, um, they don't have awareness of the different parts and like trying to, to do the big movement, like for example, go into any of the, into suspension phase or any of the phases uh, of the flow motion model. I mean, it's too much for their body, brain, nervous system uh, to understand because they understand it on on like cognitive level, but neurologically, it's like too much to handle in the beginning. And like yeah. we always we always laugh that when I ask him to do something from let's say suspension, like hip hike, whatever, um, tibial internal rotation, and and they struggle and they start shaking. And I'm like, and you thought walking is easy, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's absolutely true. Yeah. And we yeah. always laugh. So, and, but as you said, sometimes when I give them the ideas, people are like, so how am I supposed to walk now? Should I push through the big toe or should I do this or that? And I'm like, yeah. you shouldn't think about it. It should come naturally. That's why we're doing the things here. Because if you, if you try to force it, I mean, it's not going to work. It, it will yeah. uh, disturb something, as you said, on the way up or on the way down in sequence. Yeah. And then... It's, it's very interesting. We, we, we actually can not, and this is ironic, uh, given the industry and the advice sometimes, but we cannot control um, or should not be in a position to try and control our movement when we're walking. So, um, you know, any, anybody who's been through a process, I think, feels and asks the question you've just asked is, so do I need to hike my hip when I put my right leg forward? And the answer is no, you just need to spend some time to put the movement input into your body, have your brain experience that movement input in your body. And if it deems it to be of benefit, it will use it as it goes forward. And, and that's how, interestingly, we see our clients navigate their rehabilitation process. So they uh, can be in a position on day one um, and they do some movement work and things change and they can be in a different position in day two. So let's say that's a week later. So the, sec the second session, you have to do a whole new assessment again because it's the same person, the same face, the same voice, the same name, but their structure can be different. Um, and, that, and that doesn't mean that they're better. It just means that they're different. And so we will, you might find something else. And some people liken it to the layers of an onion. So you peel one layer off, you peel another layer off. Um, a friend of mine talks about lifting lids. So it's like you lift a lid to look for problem one and problem two, and it's not layers of an onion are kind of sequential and in order, mm. but lifting lids is random yep. um, and it does, it is totally random. So one, I've got a foot problem um, and you can see that something's not right. And you, you mobilize the foot, you teach the foot to move better. And that pushes out a new problem that wasn't present the first time around. And that always fascinates me. And I sometimes think, did I miss it? But, you know, you, you do, you're so diligent in assessment uh, that it, you know it almost wasn't there the first time, but it has appeared the second time. And, and so as the body reorganizes itself, it pushes new problems out to the surface, which is something Chris uh, probably described on your course of stirring the pot and yep. putting on all the stuff flows to the surface. And so it saddens me sometimes to hear, you know, that people will go to their chosen practitioner for for their regular treatment so like once every three months i need to go and get my back cracked is you, yep. know, you, hear, you hear that and that just means that they're actually just putting their default stuff back in in place so that's an easy win for the practitioner who knows that john's coming in crack his back send him away um but we want better than that we want to understand why that back needs cracking that way we want to be able to put movement input in that actually means you never have to have that again um, and and we'll start to work backwards through his compensations or the way he chooses to un unravel himself. But I also wanted to say um, about the unconscious thing um, is that if what, what what's quite amazing is is just how quickly somebody's walk can change inside a session and that they can feel it if 
you do the right the right thing so if you know that if you i, I remember a chap on a course in vancouver and he said um um that everybody had they kept trying to decompress his big toe because it didn't move mm -hmm. and then when i felt his big toe it, it felt like it wasn't attached so it couldn't <laughs> have been like either everybody had pulled it off <laughs> or they were doing the wrong thing right <laughs> so i i just did the opposite and i pushed his big toe hard in back into the joint and had him um bend his knee and try and get the foot to articulate and the toe caught it was a i felt it in the moment and his gait completely changed in in that in that second so to reintroduce a, a joint structure that has been missing from the body uh, alien to the body or not able to function inside the body just to give them that back uh, will have a profound impact and that they don't then have to think about hiking that hip they just do it they do it because the permissions are in place so if all of our movement is about having permission then all of our failed movement is about those permissions being absent and so it's we by by genuinely focusing on the joints making sure that each one of them can do what they're supposed to do you're giving permission for the brain to recognize its potential, for the muscles to move in the way they're supposed to, for the joints to flow together as they're supposed to, and for us to be able to access our left and our right foot evenly and equally. Um, and that's what the finding center principle is, is being able to being able to experience both sides of that centered position, that neutral position, and have the brain find its most optimal resting place for itself. And that is often not where they are presenting today because they wouldn't need to come and see you if they were presenting in any other way. So, yeah. And, and one thing going back to the, whatever medical professional and cracking their back or, or spine, whatever, putting them into place. I, uh, I keep telling people that even if it feels good on, on the moment and they, they feel relaxed for a couple of hours later, I mean, neurologically, nothing has pretty much changed because the body only understands and nervous system only understands through putting force onto, onto the skeletal, skeletal muscular structure. So, I mean, that's why you need to keep going there or going to the massage in order to, to feel relaxed. And like what I believe is the most, um, uh, most beneficial thing uh, that that we can do as as professionals is give them the tools to to assess and reassess and, and understand uh, what is supposed what is supposed to move how so that they know when something needs to be addressed pretty much and, and in this way empower them to to do it on their own. I keep telling people I don't. I don't, I don't want to see you like for two years. Like if, I mean, if you want to still come and train and, and develop things and strength or whatever, mobility, gymnastics, I'm, I'm fine. But I mean, I mean, I have way too many clients to worry about and I'm, then I get too many referrals to, to keep up with. So, I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to see you. Like, it's not like I need, like I need to, you to keep giving me money, just like, like going to the crack yeah. practitioner. So, so yeah. <laughs> And, and in that regard, because because uh, because a lot of a lot of uh, people are playing different sports and like are physically active. Some of them like um, are pretty passionate about their hobbies. We have some ultra marathon runners. We have some people lifting weights and doing all all sorts of things. Um, Oftentimes, I mean, I'm not sure how it's been with your clients back in the days when you were doing one on ones mostly, um, but. A lot of those people, because it's their passion, they think of the the the, the practice that we do and the the, the assessments and, and the, the exercise we go through. They think of it as a corrective exercise, which is not fancy. It's the boring thing, but they don't realize, and it's taking away time from their 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 practice and, and their passion, sport, activity, whatever. Yeah. And I keep telling them that it's actually it's gonna actually benefit and it's gonna improve their performance and and their whatever they're doing and their life in general. Because like a hundred percent of the word people use when we work on their body, if they've had any stiffness, pain, whatever. After the session, if we've done the right things, they would use I f they would use the the sentence I feel lighter. So like yeah, like everything's relaxed and loose and it's in place. So um, can you give a, a, a if you have any examples of like uh, sports people you've, you've worked with? Because I remember the one with the deadlifter guy who was able to deadlift like a. Um, pretty amazing amount of kilos after you worked on his posture or something else because so I mean to, to give people reference and how, why this is important and it's not like something they should disregard 
Well, I think um, I'm just thinking that there's, I have these three words beginning with E in the, at the top of my head, which are, um, is effective, so effective movement, effortless, which is without effort and energy conserving. Um, and, and it's those, those three things that um, bring about that uh, word you used, which is lighter. So I used to say that AIM movement work gives people poetic license. So they would, do, they would feel lighter, they would feel grounded. They say these words that you just wouldn't expect to come out of their mouth, you know? <laughs> and every now and again, they'd feel centered, which is like, woo. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's not the usual words that some, you know, that, that they say. So this idea of being effortless actually lives in not, not just your body, but the words that come out of your mouth. And, and conserving energy means that you've got so much more resources available to achieve what you normally achieve when you're in a more effortless space. And so the, the, um, the power lifter story um, was, was that he was in his three month training zone uh, um, for competition and was at his, um, at his pat, um, what's the word, plateaued at his one rep max and um, had kind of limited VMO. And, and that was what he actually wanted was to get more shape into his VMO. Um, and I'm, I'm bumbling around with the story because it's not my story, it's Chris's story that he would have shared with you. Um, but it is a good one to, to, to highlight the, um, the, the, the question. Um, so with one session was if we look at the VMO and what is the role of the vastus medialis muscle on the inside of the knee and you recognize it that it is to decelerate pronation. Uh, it's that set up to decelerate a flexion of the knee and an external rotation of the, of the tibia. Um, and that movement in itself couples perfectly when the foot is on the ground with a foot pronation. So with the vast majority of work being um, supinating feet, um, bending knees out towards the little toes instead of the big toe um, is, is actually going against the actual role of the vastus medialis, which is to decelerate the pronation, to create an environment where the knee moves it with less and less structure underneath it. Um, and of course, this is a movement that most people would want to avoid. I've been I've done it in class and I've had physio walk into the room and she said, if I did know, not know what you were doing, I would have thought that was the worst thing in the world to do. <laughs> so some very simple standing on one leg, bending the knee, taking his left non standing leg around a clock face. If he stood on his right leg to 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, nine o'clock and creating the flexion um, and external rotation of that knee, which is just load, loading the VMO, loading the VMO, encouraging the foot to pronate. So the, the foot has, as I said earlier, 33 joints all of which move in a specific way to create a pr pronation. We'll use wedges uh, to help organize that. But it's the fact that your brain is having the experience of all of these bones moving into that way, which pulls on all of the tissues. So we're now not just talking about a vastus medialis. We're talking about actual length in the foot as well. Muscles of the foot, muscles of the calf, muscles of the... Um, uh, of the knee, including the VMO, and then muscles of the hip as well, because you're going to generate this triple flexion action that, with a three-dimensional out outcome. Um, and that was pretty much it, was just to get his VMOs back online. Um, and the unexpected outcome, which are always the nice ones that you're looking for, was that he was able to increase his uh, personal best deadlift when he was already plateaued at his one rep max uh, by a ridiculous amount. I wish I could remember the number, but... Um, it it was it was the unexpected outcome that he was able to get immediately from having more integrity in his structure, more muscles involved, more movements involved, um, and the lift became. If you if you think about his previous one rep max, it became effortless, and probably because he was using more of his resources, he was able to conserve more energy, um, and so that that was a really nice. I was, there's another quick one that I remember with a runner. This was a long, long time ago, and it's quite a funny story in the end because he, um, it, it kind of highlights the, the potential in the brain for normalization. But this guy would run and he ran all the time, so he knows how it feels to run. He had one session um, where 
he probably had a, a pelvis hiked on the right and rotated left and a bit too much anterior tilt and a shoulder that's dropped. So we found out all the missing movements and we, we went through a normal session with him. So hike on the left, rotate the pelvis left, um, do whatever we needed to do with the shoulder. He went for a run after the session. He messaged me, said he felt like he was running so fast he was going to fall over. <laughs> the, the change in his experience of running was I normally run like this and now I'm running like this. It was, it was shocking to him. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's always, it's always uh, like the, those, those stories come from people who are in, in at least in my experience, who, people who are already physically active and have some reference points um, from their sport, from their activity, because like yeah. with everyday people who like uh, sit at the desk for 10 hours and don't, don't, don't move at all. The, the, the effect won't be won't be as quick because I remember when I was in Lisbon after the nine to six or nine to seven uh, day of learning I would just go go out and wander and walk around the city because yeah. all, after all the um, in, in integral work that we've done like and putting some uh, some steps on top of that and I, I suddenly I, I, I uh, immediately felt the, the differences and like within the six day period, and that that was a game changer for me as well. So uh, it, it is important for to have some reference points and baselines. I do have a um, a, not, a non athlete. There was a, a little, literally a little old lady, who <laughs> was really stiff and really struggled with movement, and she obviously had pain and high risk of falls. Um, and I, I literally, we did nothing different to what I just described with the runner, or probably nothing different to what we just described with the deadlifter. But the movements are done at her pace in in her time, um, with putting a, a, her foot on a step, using the wedges to help her foot create a shape, getting her to gently bend her knee, getting her to gently put rotation into her spine, all under her own steam. So nothing forced, just whatever she's completely capable of. Um, she <laughs> she actually made. I heard noises come out of this lady's body that I like it was like an old rusty shipyard There's <laughs> kind of sounds going on. It was amazing. I'll, I'll never forget it. But um, she, she, you know, her, again, her walk changed really quickly. The lightness, the ability to feel wider in her stance um, and all of those stuff. And, and she said, uh, I remember her saying that her holy grail was that she could, she could actually reach up and get the vodka off the top shelf. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was it was a very similar she was aware of it she could feel it and it was a, it was a big change um and i think what's important about that last story is is and it would have been no different with any athlete is that you don't force it it's all done under their own steam so it's all what they're capable of um it's sort of just about when you're exposing new movement to a body part that they, they the, the person has no appreciation of that movement until they have it and so to to get them it is really difficult it has to be done slow it has to be done steady the cueing has to be good when you're trying to sequence 33 bones in a foot one in an ankle two of the knee uh, and then the hip and then the pelvis and then all the spine there's a lot you can't ask anybody to do that deliberately and so it is it's slow work it's steady work it's careful it's considerate um, and it's done under their own steam so that when they actually experience the thing that you're asking them to experience, their brain kind of has this kind of moment of, oh, I've got that. I know what that is. Um, and I mentioned earlier that A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. and then when you get to G, G does too much, um, is when you organize the body in such a way, so it's uh, the mass is appropriately placed on top of the foot, for instance, and all the bones in the foot are moving, all the bones in the knee are moving, all the, uh, when I say all the bones in the knee, the femur, tibia, fibula, then the hips moving, the pelvis are moving. As the more and more joints you get in moving together, the more they all have to organize. You can't have one doing too much and one doing too little. That's the problem. And we're just trying to reorganize it. So getting it into the appropriate shape, the correct shape is the thing that organizes the whole structure. And that's when where joints move too much, the muscles get really high demand and where the joints move too little, the joints, the muscles have nothing to do. So people who have muscle discomfort in areas where they've got lots and lots of work to do by organizing the structure. So that joint does less, the muscles all of a sudden have less to do. They're not overexposed to in incredible demand they're actually able to to rest for a while and um, and recover 
And that can be a subtle difference between somebody having long-term hip pain and, and not. And not. Yeah, and I always give that example because I come from a, a from a corporate background. I used to work in the corporate uh, field for like ten years or so, and like I've always been in the people who actually do their work. I mean, have like um, a work ethic, and there's always like people in the team who just go get their salary and then go and get their salary and so on and so forth. And like I, I, I tell the story of like 15 people team uh, where like three or five, four people are doing all the work, rest of one are just chilling around. And then at one point, the three or four people start yelling because they're pissed off at the other guys for not doing anything. So pretty much the pain and the muscle tension is, is, is that those three or four people. It's a perfect analogy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like uh, talking about because you, you were discussing the taking the, the foot again and the shapes and everything else. Uh, we need we need to I mean it's it's imperative to address the the villainized pronation and the orthotics everyone's favorite topic um, because almost like I would say like almost 100 percent if if not 100 percent of people who come to me who have been seen by a medical professional or somebody who sells orthotics they've gone to the force plates I actually did an experiment like a few a few months back I went to a such place because I had time I was waiting for my son to finish his BJJ class and I I saw this store and I'm like I'm gonna go in and and go on the force plates and let's see what they say and I, I came up with the story and I'm like I have the bunny on bunny on my right foot and she was like no wonder, I mean, this hurts because like uh, it's a bunny and I mean, you need to buy orthotics and I'm like, okay, and let's put it on the force plates. And she was talking about the force distribution and all of that. And I thanked her and I thanked her and left. It's good because I was wearing the mask because I was able to hold my facial expressions while like <laughs> we were talking, but I did that experiment by myself. And then a hundred percent of the people who come to me, the new clients are there. Like um, I've been advised to put orthotics in and most of the people, since they've come to me, they were looking for answers um, on different than their orthotics. And they're like, but I don't want to do that. I want to change things through movement. So uh, what is your what is your two cents or or maybe more sense on the topic on the topic of orthotics? Because I'm guessing there are some cases like clinically when when these are needed and sometimes because I'm not a medical professional myself. So I tell the people, yeah, if it hurts, use it but don't don't bypass the, the issue don't buy, buy, bypass the problem continue working on it and take it off for, from some time to time to check if, if things have improved for example yeah um the answer for me is is going to be the same for putting orthotics in to the foot to give it a better structure it's the same going to be the same answer to should i take my shoes off and, and be completely barefoot all right so what you have is everybody has a, 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 a foot posture that is unique to them. Not that unique. You'll, you'll see it replicated many, many times. But um, the, the thing to recognize is that the foot moving well should be able to access two shapes. And those shapes are a pronated shape and a, pro a supinated shape and from its journey from one to the other. So if we listen to the pronated shape is a flatter arch and, that's the, and, and also the, the supinated shape is the higher arch. So if you're at both end, either end of that spectrum, so I can have a high arch, they, they can sell you the idea that to uh, build the orthotic, to take the pressure from just on the met heads on through the heel and distribute it through the arch. It's a great idea. You're gonna take a lot of pressure off those points and be more comfortable. If you've got a flat foot, the flat foot rolls in, turns out, has an impact on the knee, has an impact on the hip. If one's more flat than the other, you have a you can have a kink in the spine. And so once upon a time, they used to draw the wonky spinal posture on the orthotic uh, leaflet, put the orthotics in and the spine would straighten up. And, and technically it's that's absolutely accurate. We used to build them in uh, ski boots to help people uh, to basically achieve the very same thing. Um, is, are they bad? No. Um, are they useful? Uh, sometimes. Um, are they not useful? Also sometimes. And that's that comes down to a, a, a good valuable assessment. The problem is, if you can't access both ends of the spectrum that we've been talking about, um, then the, the limitation of foot 
movement potential is is present so that foot is going to struggle to move the more uh flat the foot is the less chance it has to pronate and the less chance it has to pronate means that those muscles that we lengthen before contracting have less chance to lengthen and that reduces our chance of achieving a supination so our limit our movement our joint range gets really 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 small and then people have stiff feet people want to roll their plantar fascia uh, they have achilles problems because they can only move through the ankle not through the feet uh, they have foot pressure problems through the second metatarsal third metatarsal neuroma type area because they mm -hmm. can't keep the first and the fifth on the ground and yet we can build an orthotic to bring the first and fifth to the ground we can create a shape in the arch that changes changes the foot position so that the legs more straight and you can and the pelvis is more aligned but none of that none of that will reintroduce movement to the foot none of that will teach our foot to be able to access the two possible shapes that it is designed to access which is to pronate and to supinate so you're effectively taking a structure that is like this lifting it up and propping it up like this that is not teaching teaching it to move it is going to take pressure off the back 100 percent. so the real value here um is is in actually educating people to recognize not how you move 33 joints because that's really complicated but how you access these two shapes how do i teach my foot to pronate better and supinate better it can be done through movement it can be done without a practitioner can be done with some minor tools that, that we use these wedges um, and if you don't have wedges you can use a towel a rolled up towel or some magazines or yoga mat um, and just start teaching your feet to move properly now that's not about generating strength it's not about generating stability it's not about gripping the floor um, and being stable it's actually about getting the bones to move and it is one of the simplest processes that I, that I think that, that it could be undertaken. Um, and during lockdown, there's been so much opportunity to spend some time standing on your feet, moving, moving your bones um, and seeing what happens. And the impact is incredible. So there's 33 joints down there. And if they are struggling to move, then you are going to be using one restricted higher up to the movement potential. And you're going to be overusing certain joints, probably around the low back and the hips to compensate for that lack of movement. Um, that that movement education is not going to change if you put an orthotic into the shoe. Um, I think it was um, in the press recently, basically supporting the idea of supportive shoes in during lockdown times because people are spending more time barefoot. But yeah, barefoot's not a problem. Lack of movement is a problem. And so for uh, the same, that's when I said about the, the barefoot idea is 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 it if I go barefoot, will that solve all of my woes? Okay. Well, if your feet can't move, no, not necessarily. So it, it's, it really is a very simple process. There's two shapes that we need to teach human beings how to move, how to move their feet. We've got little devices to help and, and guidance to, to do that all on your own without, without ever visiting a practitioner. Yep, and like I see the uh, the other radical end of the spectrum is the barefoot communities and barefoot people and like, um, I recently did a, a podcast with Steven from Zero Shoes. Um, they're, they're, he's a great guy and he's all about education as well, not just like selling the, the shoes and, and making profit out of it. But I keep telling the same thing, like if your foot hasn't moved uh, for, for a while, it's probably not a good idea to go like radically and throw all your shoes away and like buy only barefoot because the chances of getting injured because your structures are, are not like capable of, of taking those forces are pretty high. And then if you don't reintroduce any movement or any mobility in, in that foot, I mean, it's not gonna make big of a change anyway. So like, it's not a like one, one thing that fixes everything. No, it's really, it's, I think movement in the, it's 33 bones in each foot, um, sorry, joints in each foot um, and the 26 bones. So you have, you have seven in the neck, 12 in the thoracic, that's 19, another five in the lumbar, that's 24. And then you have your sacrum and your coccyx, that's 26 and they're fused. So we've got 26 bones in our feet and 26 bones in our spine. We've got two feet, that's 52 bones. And if the left foot and the right foot don't move identically well to each other uh, or rest in, a, in an identical way, ideally in center, 
So if they stand in centre, then we can have a level pelvis and an upright spine. But if they're not, if there's any change left to right, it will create distortions. And therefore, we must pay attention because we're up on our feet a lot of the time. So we must pay attention, not just to the movement in the foot, but the movement in the spine as well. But um, the 52 bones are going to trump what happens at the 26 in the spine. And so we have this spine centered, be stable, activate your core, transverse abdominis, shoulders back. And please, let's start talking about the feet. Um, you know, there isn't a shoulders back conversation around the feet. There's literally, can you lower that arch and heighten that arch? And that should put a rotation in the leg and movement in the pelvis. And it flows all the way through. It's absolutely beautiful to watch and observe and to experience. And so that's, that's really where we, 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 in that conversation is the simple goal I would like people to take away if they're listening to this is it's not difficult to teach your feet to move um, and that's one of the things that we we like to help people with yeah I remember I remember when in Lisbon again when I I thought because I, I've been doing mobility gymnastics for a few years and then I, I had a decent decent movement awareness of my body and then when Chris yeah, is and when Chris was going through the uh through the uh, assessment and the daily routine that we were doing in the mornings, he was like, let's see how your thoracic extension is. And I thought I had a pretty good thoracic extension back then. And, and now when I can actually move my spine without, uh, without a scapula and everything else around it, without any tension and force, I, I always show the differences to, to the people because most of them will try to pull their shoulders back and down, which is like too much tension. And if, if there's no gravity, I mean, why would you want to use your posterior chain to fight it? I mean, if you're sitting and, and like staying upright and like people when talk about, I want to work on my posture and I'm like, no, you want to work on being able to enter and exit positions and not on being like stiff all the time and like yeah. fighting tension when, when unnecessary. Yeah, so. absolutely true. Movement will give you relief in all of those areas. Because yep. the only reason you're holding on tight is because the movement is limited. So if you're listening to this and you think I have tightness in my shoulders, I have tightness in my neck, um, I have tightness in my low back, it's because the movement is, the permissions for movement are not that yet there. That doesn't mean you have a problem, but it does. it is a ticket to, to get started at looking at what movement is available and, and you could do. And again, um, I think if people, you know how people know their yoga postures and they know their Pilates moves and they know how to go to the gym and run a program. Yep. That's all up, up here stuff. The foundations that we're talking about here is how to move your body before you get there. But if you can learn a, a, a yoga series, you, you can learn these movements. They're, they're not challenging. They're very, very simple movements that you can invite yourself to explore every single day. They, for some people, they become a warm up. I, I literally warm up by making sure my body parts move in the way they're supposed to and you're mobilizing muscle at the same time and then you can start to, to do it. So we're really talking about the foundations of movement here, not the, uh, not the type of stuff you do um, during, your, during your sport, but they will give you more permission in that effortless and energy conserving space to have access to, to your sport or just your normal life, reaching vodka off the top shelf. Exactly, I was going to say, this is a uh, strong enough drive and motivation to come see you, I mean, the vodka. Yeah, <laughs> it's, on, it's on my shelf, yeah. <laughs> especially um, when homeschooling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and about uh, about um, warm up, I mean, I can also relate to it because when I was like preparing uh, for the Athens Marathon I ran in 2019, uh, I was following, I was reading Helen Helen's book, Helen Hall's book, even with your shoes on. She's also plan uh, on, on the plan to be a guest of the podcast. But great, uh, great. But I was going through the book and like, I remember she was advising that you do a 10 minute walk before you start like running. And then, but having the awareness of all those subtle movements and the small things and how they're moving, those 10 minutes really gave me a window of like exploring how things work and addressing it. And then when I started to uh, when I started running, I was focusing on the skills and the different parts of the body and which, because from day to day, things were moving in a different way. So I was getting more, uh, more load in different parts of the, of the body. But when you focus your attention to, to the movements, you can actually uh, sense it. Otherwise, otherwise it's just like monotonous, like yeah. uh, 
dull feeling of, of just like running. And, yeah. and it might give you the, the runner's high, but for me, it was more like exploration and like learning the skill because running is not my thing per se, but I used it as improving my skill and understanding about the movement. So now when I work with clients, I know how, how body is supposed to work. So, yeah. and uh, last question I have for today. Okay. Uh, you have that on the platform for all of us who have learned from you, you have the video which says, where do I start? So where do people start? Currently, we uh, unfortunately, uh, as I'm sure most people are aware now, we, we're not running lovely six day retreats in Lisbon. <laughs> um, so there are two types of people. Obviously, there are practitioners who would like to learn our work. Um, and we have begun to put the work online. Um, and that is currently a closed chain biomechanics of the lower limb course. Uh, and that is essentially going to take you through the specific mechanics in all three dimensions from toe up to the pelvis um, to as, as, a, as a get started. Um, and we've decided already that even when we do get back to six day retreats in Lisbon, that this course would be a prerequisite anyway. It's going to have to, whatever we produce online needs to be the stuff that makes those courses absolutely, it would be amazing not to have to teach 100% new people but people who are already invested in the work and learning and getting some results with clients and then take them up uh, to the next level. We actually do plan to get the whole spe um, spectrum, the whole uh, syllabus and curriculum of, of our courses online. Mm -hmm. So that's the start place for, for, for those. There's also uh, for the practitioner as well, but what was originally designed to help people help themselves um, and take ownership of their body, which is the, you actually used the line already in, in this podcast, but what we're really interested in is helping people empower themselves um, by taking ownership of their body, learning about their body and being able to put movement into their own body to essentially, if not solve their own problems, actually find out what really needs to be treated and worked on. So um, you might find out through the programs that it's your wrist that needs looking at. And the reason you're not getting any better is because you keep having your back treated. If you keep having your back treated, by the way, and it's not getting better, then the back is not the problem. Um, so let's start to pay attention to, to other things and, and find out what they are. So our two courses at the moment, um, and hopefully will be a third um, later this year, um, is Wake Your Body Up, which is an exploration of your own pelvis, spine, rib cage, and skull. Um, and wake your feet up which is an exploration of your feet the two shapes we've talked about in this podcast um, movement in the knee which we talked about in this podcast um, and all the way up to the to the pelvis and the hip um, and a lot of people say to me they still ask where do I start and I say well <laughs> if you've got upper body problems and shoulder or low back or um, even hip then you can have a look at upper body wake sorry not upper body wake your body up uh, but if you've got sore feet, plantar fasciitis problems, any metatarsalgias or Achilles problems or knee pain and hip pain again, so there's a crossover there, um, then have a look at Wake Your Feet Up. Um, I've deliberately priced them uh, at what I would class as inexpensive, less than the price of a physiotherapy session um, and a lifelong uh, piece of work. So, so you can understand your body, move your own body, assess your own body, um, and start to have a think about how your own injuries are playing out in your in your life. Um, and so I personally hope they bring a lot of value to people. Um, we know that they do. Um, and and uh, it really does enable people to take ownership of the body. And part of the take ownership, Rado, is, as you said, is you don't want people coming to you to rely on you to fix them. And it's to help people recognize that the onus is on themselves. They, they really... The real benefit to a therapeutic process is when the client recognizes that they're the one who does the healing. They're the one who does the work. And we as practitioners are basically shining a light. So our work is about shining a big light on these on these problems and helping people take home and have access to the movements they need to, to make themselves better. Um, and the final the final thing is my book, What the Foot. It just happens to be here so I can show it. Ta -da. <laughs> so um, that's also available on Amazon and through my website, which is www.findingcenter, spelled the English way, .co.uk.
I'll reference, yeah, I'll reference everything on uh, on the notes uh, here. And, and then I guess also if people need any help, I mean, I know you have providers or certified uh, uh, practitioners who have went through the courses and they're listed on your website. So yeah. if you're in the area, I mean, you can search in your own country or, or city if you can find someone uh, who's worked with Gary and then um, reach out and look for help. And the social media platform is Instagram. Um, yeah. at Gary Ward underscore AIM. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. It was again a pleasure to to chat and uh, hopefully we can do this again uh, at some time, at some point. Um, for those of you who joined today, um, I'm, I'm hoping it was, it was useful, it was insightful, it was a perspective shift because that was my main idea, give you a different, uh, different ideas and, 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 and like uh, challenge you a little bit to uh, to think about movement in a different way. Once again, Gary, thank you very much for my absolute for pleasure, Rado. Thank you very much for joining, and see you next time. Take care.